Hi, my name is Leighton. I'm an intuitive and a mystic. And today I wanted to talk a little bit about renunciation. And the reason why I wanted to talk about renunciation is because quite honestly, we live in a society that is so obsessed with consumerism and materialism. And there's really this obsession with the self. But more importantly, there's an obsession with the lower self. And we have kind of misunderstood what it means to self-care. We've misunderstood what it means to take care of the self. And because we have such a materialistic perspective, we think that this is the way to go about it. We think that this is the way to heal. So, so often we think that the more that we own, the more that we have, the more that we allow ourselves to indulge in, we kind of see this as freedom and we see this as where our salvation lies when in reality it's the complete opposite and especially in in the context of religion and how many people have been hurt by dogmatism how many people have been hurt by religion and by cults and orthodoxy um, what ends up happening is that people feel from a place of their their trauma, from a place of their woundedness, that acts of self-sacrifice, that acts of renunciation are wrong. And we start to see that as abuse. We start to correlate it with the abuse that we experienced um, in the church or at the hands of religion. And so the way that we make up for that is to fall into that um, or lean into that luciferic impulse where we really misunderstood freedom and we think that freedom is how much we can collect, how much we can own. But more importantly, we think that freedom is this intellectualization of spirituality. And we really begin to connect to this sense of faux enlightenment. So I have personally, as someone who came out of dogma and someone who also came out of the new age, you know, there's really this line that we have to kind of balance. So I've personally gone from living a life of pure, radical, you know, um, dogmatic Christianity to then really leaning into that luciferic impulse where I was going so far in the other direction that it felt like the only thing that would free me from that was just pure freedom. And I saw freedom as my ability to be free to do whatever I wanted. And it's really funny because that's kind of what Bellama was all about. Um, and it, it was kind of this question of, you know, what happens when we have absolute freedom? What happens when we allow ourselves absolute freedom? And um, the way that Aleister Crowley, I guess, answered that question in his own life was to, was to, again, approach freedom as if it means that freedom is doing whatever it is that I want. It, quite literally, he said, do what thou wilt. Um, and that's a really powerful statement because what is our will? And our will can either be influenced by our higher self or it can be influenced by our lower self. So if we don't have that um, in check, then whatever we will is going to be essentially making us a prisoner to the lower self because our will will have been hijacked by our pain and by our trauma. And we will just be willed into our, into living out the desires of our lower doppelganger again and again and again. So how do we start to overcome that? There's a lot that goes into that. And I do have a course called Overcoming the Lower Doppelganger. Um, I have it available on my website. I'll link it below. And if that's not something that you can afford, I do have a form that you can fill out to see if you're eligible to be sponsored for free access to the course. 
And honestly, where my heart is with that is, <laughs> look, I would like income. I do appreciate when someone can afford the course, but if someone really needs it and they can't afford it either way, then I want them to be able to have access to it because I know what it's like to be in that position. And because honestly, I think that this is really, really important work. And I don't think that your financial situation should play a part in preventing that. So do keep that in mind, but I do ask that everyone that fills out the form does so with complete honesty because I want to be offering that sponsorship to people that really need it, right? Um, but when we're overcoming the lower doppelganger, there is so much that goes into that and it is an extremely broad topic that honestly, I will probably have to eventually create a second course on because of how much goes into it. But there's this level where in order to disconnect ourselves from that lower self, we have to create space. And how do we create space if we are continuing to live the same way? How do we create space if we are continuing to interact with ourselves and with the world in the exact same way? Well, we really can't. Um, and that's where renunciation and self-sacrifice comes in. Because at the end of the day, we can do all the shadow work exercises that we want. We can say all the prayers that we want and we can really do all of the things. We can do all of the study. And um, if we are still interacting with the world the way that we've always been interacting with it, and we are not knowing what sacrifice means within ourselves, then how can we connect truly to the one that sacrificed everything for us to even have the opportunity to etherize according to him, um, to etherize our blood and, and raise ourselves to a higher standard, to be able to live as, as higher humans, really. So um, just to get into, I'm just gonna read the, the definition. Um, according to Merriam-Webster, it just says, the meaning of renunciation is the act or practice of renouncing, specifically self-denial. And then um, Wikipedia says, renunciation is the act of rejecting something, particularly something that the renunciant has previously enjoyed or endorsed. And in religion, but this can be spirituality, just any kind of spiritual path in general, renunciation often indicates an abandonment of pursuit of material comforts in the interests of achieving enlightenment or true freedom. So this is a topic that is so important to me. And it's funny because I actually used to live this way in a more um, dogmatic <laughs> way. And it was not possible for me to maintain it because I, I, I had so much imbalance within me still that my acts of renunciation were more like putting off something that I still really wanted. And so as much as I would lean into these acts of renunciation and really try to take it on, I wasn't ready. So this really has to be something that we feel called to do. It has to be something that we are prepared to do. And in order to be prepared, we have to mentally and spiritually and emotionally and, and physically prepare ourselves. For example, if you are planning on doing a fast um, for, for the, the sake of renunciation, you would want to prepare the body. So you would want to make sure that you're having enough electrolytes. Um, you know, you're slowly cutting out things that are bad for you. You're slowly cutting out sugar, sugar and processed foods and these things that are going to really densify the body. That way you kind of have this gradual progressive change as opposed to all of a sudden shocking the system, going from eating McDonald's and smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee every day to all of a sudden not eating anything at all and praying every day. Your vessel will not have the capacity to handle all of that. And so that's kind of what I did is I went from, you know, railing Coke every day, all day, every day, and, and being a drug addict to then having this powerful near-death experience to then um, being thrust into 
this world where I really genuinely wanted to renounce my old self, but my physical vessel and, and my mind and my soul and none of that was prepared. <laughs> so, um, so I did well for a little bit and then because I wasn't primed, I didn't have a prepared mind, I, I just totally fell apart. So it's very important that we prime ourselves and that we take things very slowly, that we don't just jump into things head first. For example, if you want to start renouncing something and really living a life of renunciation, say you spend all of your time on social media and um, you don't really have a social life outside of that, but you feel very drained by social media. You feel, why did my TV just turn on? I hope it doesn't make any noise. <laughs> Um, you feel very drained by social media. You feel like all kinds of things are going on there and you, you feel very, um, influenced and you don't want things to be influencing you. Um, taking the steps towards renunciation would be something like, you know, making sure that you have some sort of social life outside of there, making sure that you you have that space filled with something that is going to kind of meet that need in a different way. Because if all of a sudden you're going from that being your social life and you're kind of frying your nervous system with all of this overstimulation all the time, and you go from having that constantly to all of a sudden nothing, you might go crazy. You might feel totally insane. So um, it's really important that we, we kind of mentally prepare ourselves going into this. So aside from the fact that renunciation really allows us to separate ourselves from the lower self, and I don't mean separate in, in the terms of bypassing, we're not bypassing. What we're doing is we're attempting to purify the form and our acts of purifying the form enable us to really hold a higher capacity to be able to transmute the lower self. So instead of just separating ourselves from it and pretending it doesn't exist, um, which is, that's not going to do us any good. It, it's still going to have a hold on us. It just might be more on a subconscious level and then we'll just lack awareness, but it's still going to have control over us. So instead of doing that, um, we want to create the space where we're putting a boundary there and the boundary is what allows us to start living in a different way. Even if it's in a really small way, even if it's you know, usually I spend all day every day on social media, but today I'm going to tell myself that I have an hour max or something like that. Even if we're taking baby steps like that towards um, the act of purification and renunciation, what, what we want to do is really see it as, um, as a boundary that enables us to be our best self, a boundary that enables us to um, really take back control over our lives. So we don't want to see it as a form of punishment. We don't want to see it as, you know, I'm doing this thing because this is what makes me a good person or because I want other people to see, um, you know, how pious I am or whatever it is. It needs to be a genuine step in the right direction, a genuine step towards purification. And so in order for it to be genuine, in order for it to be authentic, we have to set realistic goals. We can't just jump in head first. And so alongside with um, putting this boundary in between us and the lower doppelganger, one of the first things that we are wanting to get out of this is moral development. So we don't just develop morals overnight. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way. Morals are a symptom or a result of um, our integrity and a result of our level of consciousness and level of um, initiation too. So if we have been locked in the lower centers for a really long time, and we just feel like we're constantly stuck and cycling in pain and trauma, we aren't really going to be in the position to be able to develop morally because moral impulses come from the angelic hierarchy. And the way that we connect to the angelic hierarchy is through proper etherization of our form because proper etherization of our form is what connects us to the pineal gland and the pineal gland is where we actually receive 
the ability to um, develop neuroplasticity, the ability to reach meditative states, the ability to, um, to really start to make change in our life. So if we are not accessing that and if we are in survival mode all the time, well, then what do you think is going to happen? We won't be able to activate the pineal gland. And if we can't activate it, then how can we activate that positive neuroplasticity? How can we expect to see genuine change? Especially because when we're locked in survival mode, the prefrontal cortex really shuts down. Um, our amygdala starts, <laughs> starts malfunctioning. Our hippocampus is hijacked. And the brain chemically just cannot function the same way. And so we aren't going to be receiving those moral impulses. And even if we kind of have a base idea around morality, we're not going to be able to connect with it in a, in a symbiotic way where it is constantly these constant um, moral impulses nurturing us, you know, working on us, infusing themselves into us in a way that becomes very intuitive, in a way that becomes very instinctual. Instead, it will be more like we are constantly striving, like we see what other people are doing. We know that that's the way, right? We know that, um, that this is what people say morality is. And so we're constantly striving in that direction. And as long as we're striving, we are not acting authentically. And, you know, there are some people that say that if we strive and strive and strive, eventually we'll, we'll get it right. But I personally don't think it works that way. And I think that when we look at dogmatic Christianity and we see all of the, um, all of the devolution, all of the madness that's happening there, how many people are falling into really serious sexual sins and, and other, other things like that. And when I, when I say the word sin, um, what I'm really referring to is any act that separates us from ourselves and any act that separates us from God, an act that um, is really rooted in the lower self and rooted in, in, in authenticity. So I don't mean that in a, in a dogmatic sense necessarily, but we see people absolutely going insane and falling apart. And this is not a judgment because when I was in dogmatic Christianity, I did the exact same thing because you're doing all of the things, but there's this very necessary missing element of understanding the Christ impulse and connecting with the Christ impulse. And renunciation um, really needs to be something that we feel compelled, that we feel led to do, that we feel inspired to do um, by the Christ impulse. So renunciation is a part of inner work and, and a part of shadow work that gives us with self-knowledge. We cannot know ourselves truly as long as we are wrapped up in the idea of who we are that is really tied to our trauma or our lower centers or um, even just our primality. So for example, when I'm talking about somatics and I'm talking about listening to the body and giving the body what it wants, so often someone will kind of joke and say, well, my body wants a jelly donut. You know, is that, if I go and get one, is that somatic work? And I totally understand why you would think that. And this is another thing where, where people joke about that a lot with the idea of intuitive eating. But the thing is, is that realistically, your body in a healthy, balanced state does not want a jelly donut. The reason why your body wants that, and I'm not hating on jelly donuts because I really love them, but realistically, um, sugar just is not good for us. Sugar is a poison. It's terrible for the nervous system. It's terrible for the body. And I have sugar sometimes, but very, very rarely. I don't think that we need to brush it off entirely. Um, we don't need to be extreme about it, but we do need to be realistic. We need to understand that, you know, the body is not going to say, hey, give me this neurotoxin. I really want it, you know, but it will say that when it's been programmed and when it's in a state of addiction. And even if you're not going out buying, you know, 10 boxes of ho-hos and eating them all in one sitting, that does not mean that you don't still have a sugar addiction. There is sugar in pretty much everything. Um, there's sugar probably in like boxed mac and cheese and sugar in ketchup and sugar in salad dressing. I mean, it is absolutely everywhere. We cannot escape it. And so like, like the food industry, 
Um, pretty much everything at, at this point in time has a little bit of poison in it, a little bit of, of toxins in it. And so we have to really be realistic about that and we have to understand that. And when we approach these things, we have to ask, is this something that um, my body in a very healthy state would want? Or is this maybe a product of my environment? Is this maybe a product of my past? Is this maybe a product of my programming? And one way to find that out is fasting or giving certain things up. Nothing will let us know faster what our relationship to a specific thing is than when we attempt to give it up, when we attempt to release it. So if we decide to fast from McDonald's or fast from alcohol, fast from social media, maybe fast from interactions with a specific person, and all of a sudden we begin to see, wow, I'm having a really hard time with this. I can't stop thinking about this thing. I'm obsessing over this thing. I'm having intense cravings towards this thing. This is how we begin to know how much power it really has over our lives and how much it's really been controlling us in one way or another. So it, this, is, this is how we learn about ourselves. And, and in a way, um, we could consider this spiritual research. We could consider this occult research because it is. So um, if you're looking to engage in shadow work in a very, very simple, easy, and I don't mean easy in the sense that the that the actual experience of it is easy. I mean, the approach is rather easy. You can pretty much choose anything and say, you know, instead of having two cups of coffee per day, I'm just gonna have one. And just making that one small step will teach us so much about ourselves. And this is an act of renunciation. When we are, when we are renouncing something, so many people see the acts of renunciation or approaching something with humility as a very negative thing because they see it as a loss of control, as a loss of power, as a loss of freedom. But that is coming from a very wounded place. And that comes from such a materialistic perspective because realistically, our freedom comes when these things don't have control over us anymore. So I see it as a huge red flag when someone is like, oh, you know, I definitely can't say no to that thing. I need to have it every day. Because if that's how you're approaching it, how much control does it really have over your life? And obviously, you know, whenever I talk about stuff like this, there's always one smarty pants that comes out of the woodwork and they're like, oh, so what about when you drink water every day? <laughs> I'm not talking about things that are objectively good for you. I'm not talking about things that are nourishing to you. If something is nourishing to you, by all means, take part in it. But I, I should also say that even water is toxic in, in a large enough amount. So um, really, we, we want to become masters of moderation. We want that to be something that we strive towards. Balance should be something that we invite into our lives, not that we have to wrestle with, right? So... Renunciation also enables us to better serve humanity. First of all, aside from the fact that clearing out certain things within our life can create so much physical space and really allow us the opportunity to have more time and have more energy to serve other people, but we serve other people simply by taking the best care of ourselves possible. When I take a break from uh, from YouTube, you know, from, from meeting with people and having sessions with people or um, from working on a course or something like that. And I just say, I'm going to have some latent time. You know, I'm going to take a few weeks off and I am going to better myself. That doesn't just help me. That helps you too. Because when I come back, I have so much more than I can, that I can offer you. I have so much more than I, that I can share. Um, so much more wisdom that I can impart that I wouldn't necessarily have had before. And that's one reason why I do not approach what I do as, as if I am an influencer or something like that. I don't see myself that way at all. Um, I don't want to take a month or two months or however long off and have people say, you know, where is my content? Because it's not about content right? Um, it's about connection. It's about authenticity. 
and, and it's about creating something real. I want to leave and create something real and come back and share it with you. And I want to inspire you to do the exact same thing. We just live in this messed up society, honestly. It's, I mean, humanity is beautiful. The world is beautiful, but there's a lot of really messed up, devolved things going on. And we have this, this really twisted way of viewing the world where we think that we need everything right now. You know, we, we always need the next best content. We need um, the next, the next fast food restaurant that just opened up, the next vape that just dropped, the next alcohol, the next drug. I mean, um, we just, we just need it. We need it. We need it. We need all of these things constantly. It's all overstimulation. And quite honestly, it doesn't even matter how many of these videos that we watch. It's, it's good to have a teacher, right? It's good to learn. There are people that I watch all the time, but I also take breaks. I also have times where it's just me, myself, and I or it's just me and God, it's just me and nature. And there's nothing else going on because we need that. You could watch thousands of, of lectures on spirituality and the occult, um, spiritual growth, all of these things per week. But if that's all you're doing and you're not actually spending time by yourself, then very little is going to develop. So sometimes when, when we're in the act of renunciation, what we need to do is separate ourselves from our own desire to intellectualize because spirituality can also be a form of materialism. We see that with the aramonic impulse to connect with spirituality through technology. And then we also see that in the luciferic impulse to connect to spirituality through this pure intellect and through um, really being in a place of of faux enlightenment and false light where we're constantly bypassing the things that we need to be doing and we're just focusing on this accumulation of knowledge this ac accumulation of um of, of what we think is the truth but we're never applying it right or if we are we're applying it applying it very lazily so it's also important that we keep that in mind Renunciation, it, it also allows us to create a very ceremonial way of living. Um, I'm currently living in a way where I am renouncing several things in my life that I didn't even think were, were things that were a huge deal. And it's funny because I was listening to a Rudolf Steiner. Oh, I almost <laughs> knocked my whole tripod over. I was listening to um, a Rudolf Steiner lecture uh, maybe a few days ago. And um, I want to believe it was one of the nature spirits lectures. I wish I had known I was going to bring this up. I would have, um, I would have said which lecture it was, but if I, if I remember it, I'll link it below. And he was essentially talking about how when we are developing psychically, when we're developing spiritually, we need to kind of interact with things in a way where we aren't just doing what other people tell us to do all the time, but we're kind of thinking outside of the box, we're getting creative, and we are adding our own element of something that we do that we felt compelled or guided or inspired to do every single day that will lead us closer to that. So one of the examples that he gave was, you know, if you've never watered plants before, you can just start watering plants and make that a make that like a new spiritual part of your practice. But then he says, you know, don't go watering plants every day just because I say to do so, because then you're not going to be doing the exercise correctly. You're just going to be listening to what I told you to do. And he also gives an example of how um, he knew someone that started taking seven steps forward and seven steps backwards every day. I believe I'm remembering that correctly. And while he was doing that, he would visualize um, the evolution of, of the cosmos. And again, you know, he was saying, don't do what this guy did. You got to come up with your own thing to kind of um, inspire you in a, in a creative way, in an outside of the box way to connect spiritually every day. And when we are in this act of renunciation, it gives us so much free time and free space. I mean, I have also been taking a break 
from work if you haven't noticed and taking a break from social media which has been just so lovely i cannot even say at this point i'm like oh, we none of us should be on social media um it's it's not that there's not great elements to it it's a beautiful place to connect with other people i have met so many amazing people on social media but man it is also so intense and can just be really crazy so it's been really nice just being off of it um but that alongside with the other things that i had chosen to completely stop doing over the past couple of weeks has freed up an insane amount of space for me i mean i'm studying all the time i'm meditating way more than i was before um not only am i learning russian now but i'm also learning japanese and i'm smoking everyone <laughs> in russian on duolingo because i have so much time time to learn it um and i've i've been doing so many more things around the house and feeling so much more creativity come through me feeling so much more space and so I think that that is probably one of my favorite things about the act of renunciation is, is not only do you have this newfound self-knowledge that you didn't have before, it gives you so much perspective. It frees up so much space, but all of that freed space, it, it allows you to be an even greater vessel for spirit. It's just clearing away all the crap that you don't need. It is so easy for us to think, you know, oh, self-sacrifice. I'm, I'm, you know, sacrificing this thing and this is so terrible and, and I'm just going to drag my feet the entire time I'm doing this. No. Renunciation is a gift. It's an invitation. And when you feel the call, you should take it because it will open you up in ways that, that really prove to you that self-sacrifice is not a negative thing. I mean, realistically, what are we really losing? things that didn't serve us what are we really giving up things that separated us from god things that separated us from from all of this higher knowledge that we could be pulling in and this does not mean that we have to become monks or nuns and and renounce things permanently you know that may not be realistic for most people but when we periodically take these times to fast and to pray and to give up certain things it, it really does position us to just be in, in such a better place. Um, it balances our life forces and, and aligns us with, um, with cosmic order. It aligns us with Christ. And it, it really teaches us about what it means to, to live mindfully, to live consciously, because it is so easy to just kind of go through the motions. And, and I personally, I, I have a very limited diet as it is. I can really only eat certain foods. Um, and it's interesting because even some of the foods that I was eating, I didn't even realize it's like I was so hungry all the time and I was just constantly eating and um, and just cutting out one or two things. I realized, oh, I'm actually not hungry all the time anymore. Um, and I realized that those things were kind of more of an emotional comfort for me or they were triggering these feelings of being more hungry when I wasn't actually hungry. And, um, and I was just filling myself constantly with, with these specific foods. And I didn't even realize because they're, they're not even bad foods, <laughs> um, bad foods. I didn't even realize that, that it was causing a separation. I didn't even realize that it was kind of clogging me up a little bit until I decided you know, while I was, um, while I was doing, uh, I'm, I'm kind of doing a, um, a cleanse right now and, and aligning some things within, within my body. So I had decided on two foods that I was going to eat, um, which is, I'll just say I'm, I'm currently eating, um, red meat once a day and then Japanese sweet potatoes. If you have never had a Japanese sweet potato before, you have to get one. I cannot even stress enough. They are so good. Um, I don't even feel like I am fasting in eating that because they are just so delicious. I, I was talking to someone on Gigi Young's private platform on Sunday and um, she was like, yeah, they, they kind of taste like vanilla cake when you bake them the right way. And they really do. My wife doesn't agree. She's like, no, they're, they taste like a regular potato. I think she's crazy. I think they taste like, like vanilla cake. 
Um, but anyway, that being said, that's basically what I've been eating the past few weeks. And I've, like, I've never felt better. Like I just feel so clear. I feel so balanced and it's, it's been really, really great. So it's funny because before I was eating more foods than I am now, but I felt more limited. I, I was frustrated. I was thinking, you know, um, I want spaghetti and meatballs. I want apple cider. I want pizza. Why can't I eat these other foods? You know, why do I have to have um, reactions to them and, and all this stuff? And now, ironically, I feel way more freedom than I felt before because my freedom has nothing to do with what I can or can't eat. And instead, my body feels so good that I don't even want anything else because why would I if I feel so good eating this? You know what I mean? So it, it really does teach us so much about ourselves. And um, and in terms of, of living consciously, as I was kind of saying earlier with the, with the self-knowledge, you know, there is nothing more conscious, there is nothing more mindful than being extremely intentional with every single thing that we do every single day. So I was feeling like before I did have a schedule, but I had so many little things that were kind of just mucking it up and, and getting in the way. And I didn't even realize it. I was just, I, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm doing plenty and then I have a great schedule and this is great. And, um, and just the simple act like what Steiner was saying of, of changing something up and doing it in a very intentional way. And, and I, I started doing some other things too that I'm, I'm not going to share that also have been helping tremendously um, in terms of, you know, making a conscious effort to do something kind of ritualistic that is, that is balancing me, that is aligning me in some way. But as I made these simple changes to my schedule, I noticed that I started living completely differently. And um, for example, before, if I exercised, I was exercising like late at night before I went to bed as a last, as a last resort because ugh, I realized I hadn't exercised and, and I needed to do that. And so um, now I'm going to kind of make sure that I do that before I go to bed. And I wasn't intentionally rushing through it or anything. But I really didn't have the motivation to wake up in the morning and exercise first thing. Well, what do you think I've been doing now? Um, I didn't set out to wake up in the morning and exercise first thing, but I rearranged my schedule and, and kind of cleared out so much in a way that I started going to bed earlier and I was feeling better and then I would wake up and I felt more well rested. And then I'm like, you know what? Why don't I just work out? And, um, and I have just been doing so much. And... At the very least, you know, even if you are not practicing renunciation for the purpose of um, of better etherization, because it, it does impact that. And and when we are when we are living a life of renunciation, if you feel called to live a life of renunciation, then um, it, it can really clear out a lot of our karma too. And we should never approach that in the sense of. I'm being punished and now I'm going to punish myself. That's another mistake that I made when I went from drug addiction to dogma. <laughs> Sounds like a documentary, right? From drug addiction to dogma. Um, I, I really approached it in, in that way. And I, I approached renunciation as a form of self-harm. And as soon as we do that, we are not connecting to Christ anymore. Um, we are, we're operating out of the lower self and in, in the, in the greatest twist of irony, um, we are attempting to renounce the lower self, but we're really connecting it more. We're really connecting to it more. Um, and we're really re renouncing the higher self because our actions are not rooted from a place of love and this Christ inspired act, um, they're not rooted from a place of being positioned to the higher heart. They're, they're rooted from a place of shame. They're rooted from a place of, of fear. So where, where we're coming from, the position of our heart matters. It matters. And we need to approach this um, very, very carefully and, and very honestly, because the goal of this is to teach us sacrificial love, sacrificial love towards ourselves, sacrificial love towards Christ and sacrificial love towards humanity. So that's, that's it. <laughs> that's, 
that's what I wanted to, um, to talk about today. And, um, if you have any thoughts on renunciation, if you have any stories about it, I would love to hear it. I would also like to say, speaking of, of someone who really lived a life of renunciation, I have been reading this amazing book that I was actually gifted for Christmas. Um, it's called Joan of Arc in the Light of Anthroposophy and Spiritual Science by Bradford Judson. I would highly recommend it. It's a fantastic book. Um, he is a really, really awesome person, awesome anthroposophist, and he he's, has, has done work around um, celebrities and other historical figures. He's a historian too, and just, just a really all around cool guy. So I, I would check out his stuff if, if you feel like it. Um, but I have just found it to be so inspiring. I have always loved Joan of Arc. I have always felt very drawn to her, very connected with her and with that archetype. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, to drop that in too. And as always, thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, um, maybe leave a comment. It really helps my channel and yeah, I guess that's it.